This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. <clears throat> Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, uh, as a part of our uh, regular series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asira to Nabawiya, uh, the prophetic biography, uh, keeping in mind that we are at the end of the month of Rajab, um, at the request of uh, you know the brothers, uh, inshallah, what we'll be discussing today is the journey of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is known as Al Isra al Mi'raj. Now, normally, what we do on Tuesdays is we continue on with our uh, study of the prophetic biography from where we left off. We currently are discussing the beginning of the seventh year of Hijrah, uh, but keeping in mind the appropriateness of the time and the situation and where we are in the you know lunar calendar in the Islamic calendar, and the fact that we are pretty much um, you know at the uh, time when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam experienced one of the greatest and most miraculous events of his life. And that is the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. So I wanted to take the opportunity today to talk about this a little bit inshallah and be able to appreciate exactly what a profound event this is and really try to highlight some of the lessons that we can learn and that we can take from this. First and foremost, um, a little sense of history is always very important. We probably, a lot of us are aware of some of the details of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, but a sense of history to understand exactly when it occurred, and that will help us understand why it occurred when it occurred. So when did the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj take place? Actually, before we even get started, let me explain the name. Because we say the name so often, so we sometimes hear people say the night of Mi'raj, and then sometimes we hear people saying Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. So what exactly do these words mean, and what does it refer to? So there are two words in the Arabic language that are used to describe this night. The first is Al-Isra. Al-Isra comes from the, root, from the word in the Arabic language, which means to travel by night, to make journey by night. All right, and so that's the first word. Al Isra means to travel by night. Al Mi'raj comes from the root word which means to ascend, to move upwards. All right, it's used in the Quran in that particular meaning as well, in the meaning of Ta'arujul Malaikatu. Like the angels, they ascend, the angels, they go upwards. All right, so Mi'raj refers to the time or the place, the situation, the circumstance in which someone or something ascended. The time or the place of ascension. Now the, that's what these two words mean linguistically. What they refer to is this journey or this great night from the life of the Prophet ﷺ can be divided into two portions, into two parts. Number one is the journey at night from Mecca to Jerusalem. So the Prophet ﷺ journeyed at night from Mecca to uh, from Baytul, from from the Kaaba, Baytullah al Haram to uh, Al Masjid al Aqsa. Uh, or Beit al-Muqaddas, Jerusalem. So that was the first part of the journey. The second part of the journey is when he arrives there in Jerusalem, when he arrives there at Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, the Prophet ﷺ then was taken upwards. He was taken on, an, on a journey upwards through the heavens and eventually um, to the um, presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself where He crossed a particular plane that no creation of God has ever crossed before, nor will they cross again. 
So that part of the journey, the ascension, is called Al-Mi'raj. So that's what we're referring to when we say the night of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj or the journey of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj which means from going from Mecca to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem up into the heavens. Now to talk about exactly when did this occur. So I'll try to provide a little bit of a, uh, a framework uh, to understand exactly when it's happening to better be able to appreciate why it's occurring when it's occurring. This was the 12th year of Nubuwa. Meaning that this is the 12th year after the Prophet ﷺ had started, had first received divine revelation. So the Prophet ﷺ is about 52 years old at this time. He received inspiration, revelation, iqra at the age of 40. And so this is about 12 years after that point. Now, what we can appreciate in light of that is that the Prophet ﷺ is very uh, accustomed to and very comfortable with revelation. And the Prophet ﷺ has really grown into his own when it comes to this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the communication with the Divine. The second thing to take into consideration is this is seven years since over a hundred Muslims had migrated to Abyssinia, East Africa, Habasha. So it's seven years after that fact. Why is that so significant and relevant? Well, because think about the circumstances that existed seven years ago, that there, there was such severe persecution and opposition in the city of Mecca, that the Prophet ﷺ was forced to tell the Muslims to leave, including his own daughter and his own son-in-law, and many other of his own family members, and beloved companions and friends and, and followers. So the Prophet, so this is a very, so this is seven years after that fact. And exactly as you would expect, the opposition, the persecution has only gotten that much more severe. It hasn't gotten any better, it's even only gotten worse. Alright? The third metric by which to understand the, the placement of this night, and what it exactly meant to the Prophet ﷺ, was that it is five years since the boycott of Banu Hashim. Five years since the isolation uh, of the Prophet ﷺ, his family and his followers in the valley of Abu Talib. Five years since that, that happened. Alright, five years since it started. From, from basically from year 7 all the way to year 10 or year 6 to all the way to year 9. So, it's been, so that was three years long. So it's been about five years since that had started in year 7. This is year 12 now. And again, what does that signify? That signifies once again, the suffering and the plight of the Muslims. That in, in, for, the, for three years, they completely were forced into isolation, deprived of many of their own, basically their, their rights as citizens of the city of Mecca. And after living like that for three years, there had been two more years of just complete persecution and, and even though they were back in the city of Mecca, but they were treated worse than they had ever been treated before. Not only that, but personally for the Prophet ﷺ, this is about a year and a half since the deaths of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the beloved wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the mother of his children, the first believer, his closest friend and follower, and also, it's been a year and a, about a year and a half since the passing of his uncle Abu Talib, who was the man who had raised him from the age of eight, and had supported him and taken care of him, and raised him. And not only that, but when the Prophet ﷺ had stepped out into the community to basically start preaching and teaching his message, and he was faced with opposition, it was Abu Talib who defended him tooth and nail. This is also six months after the Prophet ﷺ made the very serious decision and at some level commitment to travel with his message outside of the city of Mecca. And the reason why I say that was such a commitment was because the Prophet ﷺ at some level knew that once I leave Mecca with this message and I go to Ta'if, of all places. And a ta'if was basically, they were, they, they, they were seen to be the rivals of the Meccans. Ta'if was a rival city of Mecca. 
All right, it was the second largest city, home to the second largest tribe, and there was a rivalry that existed between them. And the Prophet ﷺ knew that no sooner than I take the message there, then they're going to decide that I've gone there to try to, you know, gather or amass an army and launch launch an attack against them, and they're going to basically come after me. So the Prophet ﷺ made this decision and made this commitment. And the this is about a year and a half before the Prophet ﷺ. A little about a little uh, clo- a, a little over a year before the Prophet ﷺ would make the decision to migrate, would rather or rather would follow the command of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to migrate from Mecca to the city of Medina. So this is near the tail end of his time in the city of Mecca. So now when we put all of this together, and I, I forgot to mention one last thing, the Prophet ﷺ for the last nine years has been pub- preaching publicly. Because the first three years that he received the message, he was not commanded to preach publicly. But rather he was communicating and he was talking to people that were near and dear to him, people that were close to him. But nine years of public preaching. So when you put all of this together, what you basically understand is that the Prophet ﷺ was in a very, very difficult situation. Very extremely difficult situation. Nine years of preaching. Twelve years of carrying the message. And he was met by, you know, constant and increasingly more severe and, and, and uh, aggressive opposition from the people of Mecca. And it really, the Prophet ﷺ was a pillar of strength. And the Prophet ﷺ was a model of patience. But the Prophet ﷺ, this was starting to take a toll on him. It was wearing and tearing on him. It was very extremely difficult. And then when you factor in that the Prophet ﷺ a year and a half ago had lost his wife, lost his uncle, that emotionally was very, personally was very tragic for the Prophet ﷺ. And then when you also factor in that shortly after their passing, a little while later, the Prophet ﷺ, he goes to try to seek some type of support, some type of backing from the city of Ta'if to be stoned by those people and, and, and chased out of their town. And not only that, but when the Prophet ﷺ is coming back to Mecca, the people in Mecca find out that he had gone to Ta'if. So now Abu Jahal and all of his crew have basically started this campaign against the Prophet ﷺ, saying that look what Muhammad is doing. Muhammad has basically gone there to Ta'if to join up with our rivals, to get an army together, and then come and attack Mecca. Muhammad is a traitor, وَلَعَيَاذُ billah. He has committed treason. And they started this propagandist campaign against the Prophet ﷺ, and they basically put together a plan that when he comes back into the city of Mecca, we will ambush him. And their hope was that at the very least, we will imprison him, and, and create like a very um, scandalous public trial of Muhammad ﷺ, which hopefully can lead to a conviction and we can execute him. This was their plan. And that's why when the Prophet ﷺ was coming back from Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ was met by some of the Sahaba outside of Mecca, and they said, please do not enter. This is a plan they have against you. And the Prophet ﷺ stayed outside of Mecca for a few days, and sent word to some of the different leaders of Quraysh, different leaders of Mecca, because Abu Talib has already passed. That's part of the reason why they feel like they have this free reign, to see if anybody would grant him protection. Saying, I am the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. I am a citizen of the city of Mecca. لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran had given the Prophet sallallahu alayhi conference, you are a true citizen of this city. وَوَالِدِي وَمَا وَلَدِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath. Saying, you have every right to be in this city. As much as anyone else. This city of your forefathers, just like the rest of them. Right, so the Prophet ﷺ is trying to reach out to see if somebody would grant grant him some, you know, protection, sanctuary, safety, immunity, and multiple people rejected it until finally Mutaim bin Adi, who did not agree with the Prophet ﷺ, he was not a Muslim. He agreed to give the Prophet ﷺ protection, and then he came and he got the Prophet ﷺ and brought him back into the city of Mecca. And something very fascinating—it's a bit of trivia. 
right? But it's important to know and it's very fascinating. The Prophet ﷺ, before he received revelation, he used to go to the cave of Hira, the cave of Hira. And he had gotten into the habit of going there even more and more frequently and spending more and more increasing amounts of time over there at the cave of Hira. To the point where he was, you, one could say that he very much longed for and desired and really enjoyed you know, his time there in the cave of uh, Hira. Jabal Nur, the mountain of Nur, the cave of Hira. Because it was a place of reflection and contemplation and quietude and solitude and peace and serenity and tranquility for him. But ever since he received revelation, did the Prophet ﷺ ever go back to the cave of Hira? Never did. And we talk about it often, because part of the purpose of the divine revelation and the message was, that now it's time to take this to all of humanity. Now it's time to live with the people, walk with the people, talk to the people and communicate and share this beautiful message with the people. This is a responsibility and the obligation that divine revelation comes with. It's not just some free ride on the train of guidance. You get guidance for yourself, go find your little corner and then spend your days out. It comes at a price, it comes with some responsibility. Alright? But actually, the, the trivia from the seerah is, that the Prophet ﷺ only went back to the cave of Hira after receiving revelation, after getting his mission and his message only once. And that was at this particular time that I'm talking about, when he came back from Ta'if, and they blocked him off and they wouldn't let him enter, and he needed a place to stay for a couple of days while he arranged for some protection to enter back into the city of Mecca. He needed a place to stay, he went and he stayed in Hira. Right, so once again the Prophet ﷺ sought that comfort in the cave of Hira. So anyways, the Prophet ﷺ comes back and he resumes you know, his mission and his preaching in Mecca and it's worse than ever before. And that it is at this particular time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviates the pain and the, the, the difficulty and the weight and the burden on the heart and the shoulders of the Prophet ﷺ by taking him on the most miraculous, beautiful, amazing, unbelievable journey that any human being has ever experienced. And this journey is a form of just not him bringing back the narrative of the journey for our inspiration and motivation, and for us to learn a lesson from. And it wasn't just simply for the reason of, you know, serving as an evidence and a proof of his nubu and his risala. It is both of those things, but it was also to nourish, to, to, to nourish the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. To help him close and heal some of those wounds that he's been carrying for over a decade. The wear and tear on the person of the Prophet ﷺ. This was to help heal him. To bask in the nood, in the light of divine glory. And to be able to come back to his people with greater strength and resolve. And so this is part of the wisdom of that particular journey. Now, I don't mean to mention this in uh, the spirit of, you know, just a plug for the sake of a plug. I, I mention this because I really want everyone to understand how rich, how deep, how profound, how detailed this remarkable journey of the Prophet ﷺ is. So, um, in our, as a part of our regular series on the life, on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, I covered uh, the, you know, we went through the story of Al-Isra Wal-Mi'raj. And I covered it in about eight different sessions. So we have nearly eight hours worth of discussion and lecture on just the Al-Isra Wal-Mi'raj. And all of that's available on the Qalam website. And the reason why I mentioned that is so that I want some, I want you basically to go there, uh, download the recordings and kind of listen to them. You know, maybe over the course of your day, maybe while you're driving to work, maybe while you're sitting at your, you know, cubicle, just working with your headphones in, 
right? Just listen to it over the course of the next couple of days while we are here in the days on which the journey of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj occurred. Um, and so just listen to it over the course of the next few days. That way you get the benefit of the full details, all the reflections, all the discussions that should occur within the discussion and learning about the journey of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. Obviously tonight we have a shorter opportunity together. So I'd like to highlight a few things, a few points of benefit on the particular journey. First, I want to just lay out the basic journey. What exactly transpired? All right. So the Prophet ﷺ starts the night, begins the journey. There's a couple of different narrations. One mentions that you know um, he was in the home of Ummuhani. Ummuhani was a relative of the Prophet ﷺ. One narration, a, a weaker narration actually says that فُرِجَ سَقْفُ بَيْتِي Basically it refers to the fact that it happened in his own home. And then the third narration basically mentions the Kaaba, the Baytullah, the Hatim, the Hijr Ismail. You know the half circle that we know is actually a part of the original Kaaba. When we do Tawaf we go around it, but we try to go and pray two rakahs inside of it. It's like praying inside the Kaaba. So that is called the Hatim. So one narration mentions that the Prophet ﷺ was lying in the Hatim when the journey began. And the way this is all kind of reconciled is that Ummu Hani, her home was right next to the home of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, especially after the passing of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he had his, you know, uh, he was raising his young daughter Fatima by himself, that the Prophet ﷺ used to spend a lot of time in the home of Ummu Hani. It was kind of like an extension of their own home. Because she was helping the Prophet ﷺ you know, take care of Fatima, and just overall helping them recover from the loss of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. So referring to Ummu Hani as his own home, because it was right connected to it, and considered like an extension of his own home, that's, how that, that's why we find those two different verbiages in that narration. Now as far as mentioning the Kaaba, so the narrations mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ had gone at night to the Kaaba, and he had laid down in the Hatim, kind of at night just to relax, and he had closed his eyes, and the Prophet ﷺ was, was woken up by Jibreel alayhi salam. And the narration mentions that the, the Jibreel alayhi salam took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He accompanied him to the home of Ummu Hani, where in the private room the Prophet sallallahu then laid down, and the, the the ceiling it's like it opened up, and a couple of other angels came down. Mikail alayhi salam also came, and another angel was there with them as well, and that's basically how this journey starts. Now the beginning of this journey occurs by basically Jibreel alayhi salam splitting the chest of of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is not the first, but the second time this is occurring in his life. The first instance was when he was a child, staying with Halima as saadiya the, 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 the foster mother, right? The, the milk mother of the Prophet ﷺ. Ummuhu min al-rada'a. So, the first time it occurred there, this is the second time. And when his, they opened up his chest, basically, Jibreel ﷺ called for uh, the dish, and it was a dish that was made out of gold, and it basically had uh, water of zamzam in it, right? And, um, and the narration also mentions that, uh, so they, then he washes the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And the narration is that what this basically is uh, representing is removing. He, what is he washing from the heart of the Prophet ﷺ? Removing a lot of that pain and that difficulty and just the wear and tear that the heart of the Prophet has, had, has, to, uh, has endured over the last 12 years. So he washes the heart of the Prophet ﷺ and then finally he's got a bowl that's mentioned to be from paradise that is full of wisdom and iman and knowledge and hikmah and patience and forbearance. And he pours it into the chest of the Prophet ﷺ, and then closes his chest. After that particular experience, then they take the Prophet ﷺ, they go to where the door of the Kaaba is, the gate of the Kaaba is, and over there there is an animal awaiting the Prophet ﷺ, known as a Buraq. And they basically ask the Prophet ﷺ, sit on the Buraq. The Prophet ﷺ, in the authentic narrations, he describes the Buraq as being a four-legged animal, the Prophet ﷺ says it was white in color. And the third thing is that the Prophet ﷺ says that it's larger than a donkey. Thank you. That it's larger than a donkey, but it is smaller than a mule. Larger than a donkey, but smaller than a mule. Alright, so that's kind of the description of the animal.
There are some other really um, fascinating or interesting descriptions of this particular animal, that its head was like this and its ears were like that and its snout was in this manner, but all of those are very, very weak narrations, so I'm not going to delve into those. So the Prophet ﷺ boards this animal and then they began the journey and what's really fascinating is that the Prophet ﷺ says the very first step that the animal takes lands as far as the eye can see. It lands as far as the eye can see. Just It, it just like flashes forward. Alright? And the Prophet ﷺ says that the animal moves so fast that it basically, it's not like, it's even on the ground. It's practically like it's flying. Because it's moving with such speed that it's moving above the ground. Because the Prophet ﷺ says that when we passed over an incline or a decline, it almost felt like its legs would get shorter and then would get longer. Meaning what? That the animal stayed straight the entire time. And when we go up an incline, the animal was still straight, like its legs were getting shorter. And then we'd go down a decline and it felt like its legs were getting longer. And that's the way to describe the fact that it never moved. It never went like this, it never went like that. But it was moving so fast that it was just flying over everything. And it moves at this type of speed. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Jibreel is flying by his right and Mikael is flying by his left. And that makes you understand the Burak is beyond our comp- it's so fast it's beyond our comprehension. But keep in mind that Jibreel and Mikael are keeping up. So how fast must they also be? Right? So this is just astounding on multiple levels. And the whole objective of us really marveling at this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the angels, like the Burak, is to think about the creator who created them. How magnificent is that creator? And how powerful is that Creator? And how unlimited is His power? That these are His creation, and, and as big and as powerful, like at Sidratul Muntaha, which is, I'm jumping forward a little bit, but because I'm on the topic, the Prophet ﷺ describes seeing Jibreel in his true form, saying that his head is in the sky, his feet are on the ground, and he's got 600 wings, and when he opens two of them, then it covers the entire horizon, from east to west, and he got 600 of these wings. And he moves at the speed of light. But the, but the Prophet ﷺ says that when he comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the place of a Sidratul Munta, the Prophet ﷺ describes that due to the humility and the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the humility in front of Allah, Jibreel was like a torn up wet piece of cloth. Think of a rag. You know the rag that you kind of wipe your counter with? What is that rag like? It's kind of wet and moist, it's kind of dirty and it's just maybe a little torn up and it's just lying there like that. He said that's what Jibreel was like in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This gigantic powerful creation that we can't even imagine, we can't even perceive in our heads, in front of Allah he's like a rag. Nothing. This is Allah. So moving forward, they go about on this journey and they're, the first part of this particular journey that's very astounding is that they stop at very special places. They stop at a few very special places where Jibreel alayhi salam stops. He asks the Prophet ﷺ to disembark from the animal to get off the, 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 the ride. And then he requests the Prophet ﷺ to pray to Rakaz at that place. <coughs> Excuse me. And as they continue then, then when they get back on the animal and they continue, Jibreel asks the Prophet ﷺ, do you know where you just prayed? And he says, no I don't know, where did I just pray? And then he would tell him where he prayed. And the very first place that he requested him to get down and pray there, and then uh, they continued on from there, when the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel alayhi salam, then he tells him that, أَرْضٌ طَيِّبَ وَإِلَيْهَا الْمُهَاجَرِ you just, played in a, you just prayed in a very beautiful, in a very beautiful, pure place, and that is the place that you will migrate to, the city of Medina. So the city of Medina was commemorated on this journey by the Prophet ﷺ stopping there and praying to Rakaz at that place. Right? The next place that he asked him to stop uh, and, and pray there was Turi Sina, Mount Sinai, where Musa ﷺ had spoken directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or rather, if you follow the way the Quran said, Allah spoke to Musa Musa taklima. And then the third place where he asked him to pray was Baytul Lahab. What we call Bethlehem. That is the birthplace, Mawlidu Isa alayhi salam. The birthplace of Isa alayhi salam. 
And then they continue on from there. And along the way, the next part of the journey that is noteworthy is that they see, they observe certain interesting um, things that are going on. So the first group of things that the Prophet ﷺ witnesses is that he sees many people enduring terrible types of punishment. Terrible types of punishment. Alright? Um, such as the Prophet ﷺ, he sees that there is... Um, the Prophet ﷺ, he sees that there is a group of people who, um, whose heads are being brutally crushed. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Jibreel, who are these people? Why is this happening to them? He's worried, he's concerned. And Jibreel ﷺ, these are, he says these are those people that their heads were too busy to bow down in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were so preoccupied with themselves, they couldn't make time for salah. Then they see some people who are basically, um, you know, they they uh, they 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 have all this uh, they they have all these patches on them, and they're wandering about like animals, and they're eating dariya. Dariya is this terrible thorny plant that's mentioned in Surah Al Ghashiya, Surah number eighty-eight, and it's a it's a food of the fire of hell. And it's said in the narrations that the thing, you know, how like plants or vegetation grows from water. What grows this vegetation or this plant of hell is the fire itself. And they're eating this. And it's just completely like tearing them apart. They're also eating zakum, Which basically means that uh, zakum, the zakum literally means to violently vomit. And when they eat, then all their insides come out. And the Prophet ﷺ again very concerned, he says, who are these people? Why is this happening to them? And he says, these are the people who Allah had given a lot of wealth to and they did not use to give their zakat. They didn't give zakat. They didn't care about giving zakat. Then he sees another group of people who there's some very nice good food sitting in front of them and then there's some really rotten, spoiled, you know, worm, maggot infested, you know, food. And they, they look at the good food and then they turn to the bad food and then they eat the rotten food. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Jibreel, why would these people do this? And Jibreel ﷺ says, these are people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given a spouse to. Like a, a companion that is permissible, that is tayyib. A husband or a wife, right? A husband for a woman, a wife for a man, had given them a companion, a spouse that was tayyib, that was halal, that was a companion for them. And they left that and they went and they committed adultery and zina. That this is like leaving the good and eating the spoiled and rotten. And he sees many other things. He sees uh, another group of people who are swimming through a river of blood. And as they get close to the shore, they're trying to escape this river. And as they get to the shore, a rock is thrown and it falls in their mouth and it throws them backwards back into the river. And then they start it all over again. And this keeps happening over and over again. He says, oh, Jibreel, why? What is, who are these people? And Jibreel alayhi salam says that these are people who used to consume riba, usury, interest. He sees another group of people whose... Um, Tongues and lips were being cut off or being chopped off with iron scissors, pulled out and chopped off. Ya Jibreel, what is this? And he says, these were preachers who did not practice what they preached. And the list goes on and on and on about backbiting, about abusing people's amana, people's trust, about not keeping your promises, about slandering people, different, different things. And he saw all of this. And it basically represented all the evils and the sins and their outcome. And then the Prophet ﷺ also saw some very beautiful things, some, some, some reward and some virtuous things as well. Such as the Prophet ﷺ saw people, they would put seeds into the ground, and immediately as soon as they put the seed into the ground, it would immediately like split open, it would blossom, and it would completely ripen, and it would give fruit immediately. And then they put another seed in the ground, immediately more fruit will come out from it. Like it was instantaneous, they were getting the fruits of their labor. And he said, Jibreel, who are these amazing people? And Jibreel explained that these are people who serve the deen of Allah. 
These are people who give their time, who give their wealth, who give their money, who give their talents, they give their abilities, they give their energies to serving the religion, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies their reward for them. That instantaneous are the results of their efforts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies their reward for them. And he saw, he went to, and they went on forward and he said that um, he, there was a beautiful, fragrant and beautiful, cool breeze that was blowing. And the Prophet ﷺ says, it's unlike anything he had ever experienced. And he says, Jibreel, ma'adha, what is this? And Jibreel ﷺ said, that this is the scent coming from the woman who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun. And it is the fragrance that comes from the children and the family of that woman. And then Jibreel ﷺ tells the Prophet ﷺ that story. And he says that there was a woman who used to brush the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun. And one day while she was brushing it, the brush kind of fell out of her hand. And you know when the brush falls out of your hand, sometimes there's just a habit, you kind of say like, you know, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Like we would say or something. Right? So it kind of falls out of her hand and she says, تَعِيسَ Fir'aun. Right? تَعِيسَ Fir'aun. Like may Fir'aun be cursed. And the daughter says, you curse my father? Right? You curse your lord and your master? She says that uh, your father is not my lord and master. And she says that, rather my lord and... And she says, you have another master? She says, yes, my master and your master are both... Allah, that my and your, both of ours, master is one. And he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she says, I'm going to tell my father what you said. And so what happens is Fir'aun calls for the woman and her husband and her two small boys. And he basically starts, um, you know, he, he orders like uh, a pit dug and pours it full of like oil. And then heat it like on fire. And then he tells the woman that... If you do not accept me, then I will kill your family in front of you. And at that time, the woman, she has her faith. She says, you can do whatever you want to me. But then killing her own children, babies in front of her. So as a mother, her heart just kind of tightens a little. And... Jibreel tells the Prophet ﷺ that one of the children was still like a nursing baby, like a small baby. And this was one of the children who spoke miraculously. And the child speaks up and says, Oh mother, do not hesitate and do not back away from the truth. Allah will reunite us in paradise. And Fir'aun throws the whole family into the pit and kills all of them, but she does not forsake her iman. And uh, the Jibreel tells the Prophet ﷺ that the place where Fir'aun did this terrible act, this is the fragrance that emanates from that place. Right? To, commemor to commemorate their sacrifice. So in this way, the Prophet ﷺ also sees some very amazing, remarkable things. Re continuing on, the next part of the journey is that Jibreel ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ, they arrive at Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. When they arrive there, they basically proceed into the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ is met there by all the prophets and the messengers who were sent throughout time. They're all gathered together for the Prophet ﷺ. Now there's a lot of discussion, again I go into that in the more detailed lectures, about were they physically there, were there the souls that were there, and you can listen to it over there. Regardless of the fact, that's, those are details that honestly we're not even very privy to, and that ultimately don't really serve any purpose. The real thing that we need to know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala congregated all the Prophets to honor our Messenger Muhammad wasallam And to give confidence to our Prophet wasallam so he could meet his brothers, so he could meet the people who had made the sacrifices that he was being asked to make before him. That he knew that he belonged to a fraternity and a group and a brotherhood of prophets. Right? And they were gathered there together and then the Prophet ﷺ was made to lead all of them in prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ led, led them in prayer and that is the marking of Sayyidul Mursaleen, Imamul Anbiya wal Mursaleen. That he is the leader and the Imam of all the Prophets and the Messengers. Alayhimu salatu wassalam.
And in fact, it goes on to basically mention that even after the prayer was done, then some of the prophets that were there at that gathering, they address the gathering and they basically talk about, you know, some of the blessings Allah bestowed upon them. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he speaks last and finally amongst them. And it's some very beautiful and powerful words that the Prophet ﷺ mentions at that particular time. Where the Prophet ﷺ says, um, كُلُّكُمْ أَثْنَى عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِ وَإِنِّي مُثْنٍ عَلَىٰ رَبِّي All of you have play, praised um, you know, your Lord and Master and allow me to now praise and glorify my Master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi alladhi arsalani rahmatan lil alameen wa kafatil nasi bashiran wa nadira. The ultimate praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent me as a mercy to all of humanity and mankind and sent me as a bringer of good news and warning to all of humanity. Wa anzala alayya al furqana fihi tibiyanu kulli shayin and sent down upon me the clear delineator of truth from falsehood, of right from wrong. In it is the clarification of all things. And he made my ummah, my followers, the best of all of humanity. And he made my ummah a very balanced people. And he and he made my ummah the first to enter paradise, even though the last that they came into this world. He expanded and opened my chest. He removed my burdens from me. He elevated my mention. He made me both the opening and the seal. That He made me the opening and the seal, the opening of you know the resurrection on the day of judgment. And He also made me the seal of all the prophets, the finality of all the prophets that will come into this world. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, after the Prophet ﷺ is done with this address, he says, بِهَذَا فَضَلَكُمْ Muhammad wasallam." So you see, this is why Muhammad has virtue over all of you. Listen to him. Right? And so it's a remarkable moment of honoring our Prophet ﷺ. From that moment forward, the next part of the journey is of course they ascend through the heavens. And basically I will somewhat summarize this, but that's why I've given you a reference where you can go and listen to more detail. But they come upon each of the seven heavens. And as they approach each and every single heaven, there is like an entire like procession, there is a welcome party that is awaiting at the gates. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he kind of knocks at the gate and requests entrance. And he's asked, who is this? And he says, this is Jibreel. And he says, is anyone with you? He says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Then the angel, the gatekeeper of the heaven asks, is it now the time? Has the time arrived? Which tells you this is something that has been anticipated for a very long time. Preparations have been made. All the inhabitants of the heavens, later on some of the angels even say that this is a day, this is a moment we have all waited for for so long where we get to see and meet the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, yes, the time has come. And then the gates are open and there's angels lined up. And as the Prophet sallallahu comes through there, they're welcoming him. Marhaban. Ahlan, ahlan, marhaban bir rasul. Welcome, welcome to the messenger. Bin Nabi salih The pious, righteous prophet of God. And at each of the heavens, the Prophet ﷺ is greeted and met by some of the prophets. Different prophets at each of uh, the gates of the heavens. At the very first uh, sky, at the very first heaven, the Prophet ﷺ is met by Adam ﷺ. At the second uh, heaven, the Prophet ﷺ there is met by the two cousins, Isa, the son of Maryam, and Yahya, the son of Zakariya. They were cousins. Their mothers, Maryam and Yahya's mother, were sisters. So they were cousins, and they were both prophets. So he's met and greeted by them, and they both welcome him. Marhaban bil akhis salih wa nabi salih, and they make du'a for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They greet him. Then he goes to the third heaven, and there the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is met by Yusuf alayhi salam, and the same, you know, um, basically, you know, interaction occurs. Then the fourth heaven, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is met by 
Harun alayhi salam, or excuse me, he's met by Idris alayhi salam. Then he goes to the fifth heaven, and at the fifth heaven he is met by Harun alayhi salam. At the sixth heaven he is met by Musa alayhi salam. And then finally at the seventh heaven, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is met by his forefather, the namesake of his child who would be born later, Ibrahim alayhi salam. About whom the Quran says, Millata abikum Ibrahim. This is a legacy of your forefather Abraham. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, Do we perform the sacrifice that we conduct? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Sunnah to abikum Ibrahim. That this is the tradition of your forefather Abraham. Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then finally they proceed on forward until they reach a point that is known as a Sidratul Muntaha, the furthest reach of the creation. Where Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet describes it as there being this tree there and it being absolutely beautiful and there being streams and rivers that are flowing out from there and, and just being absolutely breathtaking. And Jibreel alayhi salam stopping there and saying that I cannot proceed any forward. If I step forward, I will perish, I will die. I will cease to exist, I will incinerate from the greatness and the sheer glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence. So I cannot proceed forward. But you are to proceed forward. Jibreel, the greatest of Allah's creation, says no. Because you are more virtuous than me. You are more beloved to Allah than me. So proceed. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ falls into sujood and prostration. And basically, there kind of an enclosure closes around the Prophet ﷺ. And then, what happens past that point? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes his best, right? Even the Sahaba would discuss it. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma would have many conversations about exactly what transpired here. But ultimately we summarize, the Quran summarizes it in saying, ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّا فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَا That then he drew near to, the, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was brought even closer to the point where he was the length of two bows, you know like a bow and arrow, bow, the length of two bows away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even closer. And it's the Qur'an's way of basically saying, that was a private moment between Allah and His beloved. And all you need to know is that he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that moment was meant for them. It's a private moment between them. And in that in its, is its own significance and beauty. I know that our own fascination and curiosity and spirituality wants to know more. But there's also something very beautiful. And this is, this is, I'm going to talk about this in just a second, that the intimacy and the privacy and the secrecy, if you will, of that moment, there's something profoundly beautiful about it. And it's very beneficial, something we learn a lesson from. So now the Prophet ﷺ returns back from there, and this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants the Prophet ﷺ many gifts, such as the narrations mentioned that one of the gifts that is given at this particular time are the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, the concluding verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, which again I go through and talk about in a lot of detail in the recordings, you can listen to it there. Um, but those ayat, you can look them up, IS 284, 285, 286. Right, the last three ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, read them inshallah for yourself and memorize them. The Prophet ﷺ said they are very virtuous, they are very blessed, they were a gift on the night of the Isra wal Mi'raj. Read their translation, reflect on them, think about them, memorize them and read them in your prayers. Particularly the Prophet ﷺ says in an authentic narration that whoever reads them at night, reads them before they go to sleep, kafatahu. That it's talking specifically about the last two verses, 285 and 286. Amana Rasulu and La Yukalifullah Nafsan till the end of the surah. That whoever reads them before they go to sleep, reads them at night, that they are sufficient for that person. Meaning, this is enough of a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way you conclude your night. Not watching television, not scrolling through your phone, not you know checking your Facebook feed. But the way you conclude your night is Amana Rasulu, La Yukalifullah Nafsan illa wusaha. Read these ayat before you go to sleep, the Prophet said. So anyways, this is a gift that's given. Of course, the most profound and remarkable gift that's given to the Prophet on this particular night is the five times daily prayer. Now we all know the story that is narrated that initially the prayer was 50 times. And the Prophet brings it. And as he's returning back, 
and he comes upon the sixth heaven, and Musa alayhi salam, he asks the Prophet salam, what did you find? What did Allah give you? And he says, 50 prayers in a day. And he says that, I experienced my people, and my people had <clears throat> more physical strength, and, and you know, time, and years, and endurance than your people do. And even they were not able to keep up with two prayers. Well, he, in the more authentic narration, he says much less than that. But some of the narration mentioned that he's talking about two prayers. So he says, go and ask for ease and facilitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلْيُخَفِّفْ عَنْكَ رَبُّكَ So the Prophet ﷺ goes back and he does sujood, prostrates before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and requests that, please, فَلْخَفِّفْ anna. O Allah, please lighten our burden and load. On our behalf, the Prophet ﷺ is asking. He could have handled 50 prayers. He's worried about us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreased excuse me, decreases five. Then he comes back. Musa alayhi salam says, no, 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 too much. And he goes back and he requests five, forty, and then keeps coming down to thirty-five, thirty, twenty-five, twenty, fifteen, ten, five, comes down. Musa alayhi salam still says, this is too much, and he says, now I can't go back. That's it. I've asked enough. And there's a lot of discussions here about why. Why was it not all at once, all in one shot made? But this shows, this is an elaborate scenario set up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show how much the Prophet ﷺ loved us and cared about us. What lengths he was willing to go to. What, you know, uh, humility he was willing to display before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And repeatedly go back on our behalf. Because he was worried about us and he cared about us. And this is where I want to talk about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the gift of salah. And I talked about the fact that that interaction was private and between them and secret. And that there's something profoundly beautiful and amazing about that. And that basically now reminds me of what the Prophet ﷺ says, As-salatu mi'arajul mu'min, that it is the ascension of each and every single believer. And that's why our salah, we, sh- we have the most private, secret moments. Yes, we come and we pray in jama'ah in the masjid. But this is exactly why I will say pray five times a day, and pray five times a day in the masjid. But we need to also then make time to pray in our private quiet moments. Wake up in the middle of the night and pray when nobody else is awake or, uh, and everyone else is asleep. So you can have that private secret moment, your moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet sallallahu arrives back, and the last thing that I'll mention is, when he arrives back into Mecca, shortly before daybreak, shortly before the Fajr time, and the Prophet sallallahu arrives back, in the morning of course, we know the very famous story, but I want to mention, mention one thing in particular that gets me every single time. <clears throat> in the morning, the Prophet sallallahu he runs into Abu Jahl, or rather, the Prophet ﷺ is telling some people in Abu Jahl over here. He says, what are you talking about? What happened? And he tells him, this is what happened. Abu Jahl's like, really? Because he thinks that this is my moment now. I'm gonna humiliate him in front of everyone. I'm gonna make a spectacle out of him now. Watch. And he goes and he tells everyone, stop, stop, don't tell the story. Wait, 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 wait. Everybody listen, listen what Muhammad has to say. Come on, come on in, come on in. And he runs outside the cabin and he's like, come on everybody, come on in, come on in. And he sees Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and he says, have you heard what your friend says? And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala says, what are you talking about? And he says, your buddy says, you know, he went to Jerusalem at night and went above the seven heavens and yada yada, etc. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, in pure, like just, only Abu Bakr could have said this, you know, this perfectly. He says, if in fact he does say that, then I have absolutely no doubt that he did do that and say that. And so they come inside and they start telling the story. And there's a couple of narrations. One, so the, the narration mentions that they asked the Prophet ﷺ, so when he says that he went to Jerusalem, they say, stop. There are some people here who have been to Masjid Aqsa before. We have some travelers amongst us. So describe Masjid Aqsa to us. And the Prophet ﷺ says, I was there for very little and it was nighttime. They're like, oh yeah, well of course, how convenient. And then Jibreel alayhi salam comes down. And the narration says that he takes his wing. And onto his wing is projected 
the Masjid Aqsa. And Jibreel alayhi salam starts to point to things in Masjid Aqsa. And the Prophet sallallahu the narration says it's like he was looking at something. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, okay, there's a door. And then there's a window to the door and there's a crack in the window. And then there's the next window and that window is kind of dirty. And he like starts to describe it in so much detail that everyone's astounded, their jaws are on the ground. And as the Prophet ﷺ mentions each and every single little detail, there's a door here, there's a crack here, there's a window there. Every time he mentions detail, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is sitting there and he's saying, Sadaq, Sadaq, Sadaq. You speak the truth, you speak the truth. Absolutely, no doubt, no doubt. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, for sure, no doubt. He keeps saying that. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he's done, he said, Anta Siddiq. You are the truthful one. You know what it means to believe. This is what belief in faith and iman is. Right, that's the day Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu earned the title from the tongue, from the lips of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as-Siddiq, as-Siddiq al-Akbar, the most truthful believer of this entire ummah. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gives all these details. And lastly, and finally, some more things the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions as a sign is that I saw this caravan and I saw this and I saw that. And one of the caravans he mentions is there was a caravan that they had been awaiting that had some trouble on the way and they were late in returning back and all the Makkans were afraid because they were bringing a lot of the business goods, the investments. And they were starting to get really nervous. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, and don't worry about that caravan, they're not too far, they, they had lost the camel, they found their camel. And the Prophet ﷺ said, they should be arriving in Mecca by the end of today. They'll be here. And they were all like, really? We haven't heard any news. You sure? He's like, I'm sure. And what just happens is naturally, you know travelers, you make an extra stop or two, one stop takes a little bit longer, something happens. So they got a little bit delayed. And it was a habit of the travelers of that time that if it got dark, even if they were just maybe an hour or two outside of the city, Right? Because it's not like cars and roads and lights and headlights and all this. So even if they were an hour or two, they would just have to set up camp. Because you have to set up your camp about 45 minutes to an hour before it gets dark. Like around the time that we would pray Asr, like after Asr, you just gotta set up your camp. Because once it gets dark, it's dark. It's pitch dark. Can't see anything. Can't do anything. So it started to get like Asr time. And the Prophet ﷺ started to worry. That if they don't make it in, these people are gonna call me liars. These people will call me a liar. And so the Prophet says, Hadith of Sahih Muslim, the Prophet makes dua. That oh Allah, you can hold back the sun. You can extend the day. And the Hadith of Sahih Muslim says that the sun was never held back, the day was never extended for anyone besides Yusha bin Nun. Before the Prophet before, before the Prophet except for Yusha bin Nun, who was a Prophet from Banu Israel, who similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had basically told him, if you launch an attack against this, these people, this army, you will be victorious, um, but only in today's time. You have today's opportunity. And they fought and they fought and they fought and they were almost to the point of breaking through the army and the sun was about to set at which time they would have to retreat. And Yusha bin Nun made dua and he said, Oh Allah, extend the day. And the day was extended so they could achieve their victory. And so the Prophet ﷺ makes his dua. And the narration mentions that the day was stretched out, was made longer to the point where people in Mecca started to get kind of worried like what's, this feels weird. They didn't have clocks and stuff, but there was a sense of time. Like when it gets around this time of the day, you got about another hour of daylight or something. And it's like three hours later and the sun still hasn't set and they started to get kind of nervous. Like, is, is the world about to end? What is going on? And the Prophet ﷺ was just indicated in dua. And lo and behold, that caravan arrives because arrives back into Mecca. And when they get into Mecca, the first thing they say is, we never thought we were going to make it in today because we thought the sun was going to set. But then it never went down. And so we said, let's keep riding, 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 riding. And here we are in Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for honoring the Prophet ﷺ's word. That is the journey of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. Just in a summary, just some of the lessons. But, but the biggest lesson of all of it is that that Qur'an that was given on that night, that prayer that was provided on that night, that messenger that was honored on that night, that's something we all have access to. Read the Qur'an, 
and reflect on it. Pray and relish it, khushu'ah. And the Prophet ﷺ learn his life, send peace and salutations upon him, honor his memory, and live your life according to how he lived his life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that has been said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasafir wa natubi. Assalamu alaikum. Hmm.